Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As my presentation is being put on board, I would like to start with a story. I was a medical student in the former East Germany. And during my studies there, I was told that this mentis is a disease of the civilized world. And I was told not to mind about the base mentis because it doesn't exist in Africa. Now, the question is, if we measure civilization by the presence of diabetes mellitus, there's no doubt that Africa is getting civilized, so as India, because as we shall see later, there is quite a lot of diabetes mellitus in Tanzania. Um, this study, it makes, it's for me easier to present because uh, it's very similar to our Indian colleagues and sisters. There are a lot of similar problems and some of the questions which were to be directed to me have certainly been directed to them. It was done uh, with, in collaboration with the Gizeh University and uh, why had we to do it in Tanzania? It has been mentioned that uh, diabetes mellitus is increasing worldwide. It's expected that 285 million people worldwide are living with diabetes. And uh, the rate, the pre-diabetic rate in Tanzania is uh, around 10%. And if all these people are to become uh, diabetic, the pre-diabetic ones are to pres be precipitated into diabetes, then, then you'll see that there will be an increase of diabetes mellitus. Although we already have 4%, we already have a prevalence of 4% nationwide. And uh, according to our own study, in Moshi, the area I'm coming from, we found a pre-diabetic prevalence of 30% and a diabetic prevalence of already 80%. And that's why I say we are getting civilized. Now, because of lack of access to adequate medication, due to, of course, the economic side of it and the distance, Certainly, life quality of many people has been reduced and will continue to be reduced if urgent measures are not taken. And in Tanzania, really, we don't have uh, any of a randomized controlled trial with beta guard in the treatment of diabetes mellitus, and therefore it was necessary to have this start done have a standardized and the quality controlled beta guard material in order to provide evidence based in recommending that beta guard can be used in the management of diabetes mellitus or at least to reduce the risk of being precipitated from pre-diabetes into diabetes. Um, as uh, I said earlier, as it's been also been mentioned by our Indian sisters, it was a crossover single blind randomized placebo controlled intervention wow. study. It was done in Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania is an East African country and uh, uh, the area 
is Moshi on the northern part of Tanzania on the boundary to Kenya. And the study was conducted on the clinical, on the Kilimanjaro Clinical Research Institute. And as I said earlier, it was done by a team of medical doctors from the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, nutrition specialists from the Institute of Nutrition in Germany. We had nurses supporting us and uh, other cadre also laboratory, laboratory people and so forth. And the objective was here to test whether a drink containing 2.5 beta guard, 2.5 grams of beta guard obtained from whole fruit would be effective in lowering glucose in pre-diabetics. In this case, we really chose pre-diabetics because we didn't like to, to, to test on people who were already diabetic and they were on drugs. Because we didn't know by combining the bitter guard and the drugs they would be taking, how much they would be precipitated into hypoglycemia. And it would have been very, very difficult even to measure the effect of the bitter guard. As it was mentioned by our Indian colleagues, uh, the sockets did contain 1.5 grams either of beta guard or the placebo. The difference was that the placebo contained only cucumber and the beta guard sockets contained beta guard 2.5 grams. It contained a, a cucumber powder, 0 0.75 grams, alpha cyclodextrin, uh, 0 0.75 grams, and this was mixed also with a little bit of lemon hair oil so as a way of also masking the, the bitter taste of the bitter guard. And we have beta cyclo, uh, cyclodextrin. Uh, of uh, 75 milligrams and a stevia glucoside of uh, 15 milligrams in the in the bitter guard sockets and these are the contents of the placebo sockets now um, the variety of bitter guard taken was this one here, NS1020, product of Nandaris Seed Company in India. This is a dark green, high yielding, medium bitter guard variety. And uh, this type was uh, grown and harvested at the AVRDC, the World Vegetable Center in Taiwan in the year 2012. And it was harvested at a marketable maturity age of 16 days after pollination. And the fruits were washed, cut, freeze dried, and, dry, and, the, and then turned into a powder. The same thing happened with the placebo uh, powder, uh, placebo which contained cucumber, variety malimi. This was also obtained from this area, from India, and uh, it was as well grown and harvested uh, at the AVRDC center in Taiwan. Once more, the process seen was uh, of the fruits was again washed. All both the the bitter guard and the cucumber, the placebo, were washed clean with clean water, and was uh, dipped in the solution of one to five, one to two percent hydrogen peroxide. Uh, they were after the washing, they were were chopped, freeze dried, and the powder was obtained. And the processing was done in Taiwan by this company here. And the packing 
of the powder was also done in Taiwan. This is the name of the company. And when the sockets were ready, they were then shipped to Tanzania and to India so that we could use the same material in order to be able to compare our findings. Well, this has been very well covered by our Indian sisters, but uh, once more we had uh, uh, two groups. Uh, group 1, AB, the crossover here, and group a, BA, 8 weeks, crossover here, and then just as our Indian friends described, we had a run in period of two, two weeks, eight weeks with first phase of intervention, four weeks of washout period, and eight weeks of the second intervention period. To start with, at N1, venous blood sample for fasting plasma glucose, glycated hemoglobin, insulin, high density lipoproteins, total cholesterol, and the triglycerides were taken. We also measured the blood pressure and the body weight and height of the participants. After that, when we started the intervention, there was a weekly control taking capillary blood sample for fasting plasma glucose. We measured the body weight and uh, certainly also the height, although we didn't expect the height to change. Again, as it was said, presented by our colleagues from India, we had very strict uh, inclusion and uh, exclusion criteria. Um, body mass index between 27 and 35 kilograms per square meter. Weight, waist circumference, 80 centimeters for women and 90 for women. O, a waist hip ratio, 0 0.8 for women and 0 0.95 for men. And the important was the being pre-diabetic of fasting blood glucose between 100 milligrams per deciliter to 125 milligrams per deciliter, which would be equivalent of 5.6 to 6.9 millimoles on two days. Or the same thing of one of 100 milligrams per deciliter to 125 milligrams per deciliter combined with glycated hemoglobin 5.7 to, to 7.5 on a single day. Just like our Indian friends, we had similar exclusion criteria, people who had chronic diseases, people who um, were taking medication, uh, blood pressure, low blood pressure as well, being mentally ill, pregnancy was excluded, and uh, Professor Kravink has explained why, why we did that. Breastfeeding was excluded, and having G6PD deficiency, and we didn't like to have people who were taking alcohol heavily. The sample size was calculated at 63 participants and we anticipated a drop out of 30 percent and we thought then starting with 82 participants would have been adequate. Actually we aimed at 90 but later you will see how it was difficult to get 90 people who were pre-diabetic and who would fit according to the criteria we had taken. 
just like our colleagues from India, we had to obtain clearance, uh, ethical clearance from the Tanzanian authorities, that is the National Institute of Medical Research, the Tanzanian Food and Drug Authority, simply because uh, the sockets were being imported from Taiwan to Tanzania. Uh, they wanted to be sure that we are not importing marijuana. And uh, we had to get a, a ethical clearance from the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical College and as well as from the university in, in, in Germany and the regional medical officer in Tanzania. Now, because of all these bureaucratic uh, obstacles, we started the screening in July, October 2013, and we mobilized participants from church in, or from religious institutions like uh, churches, mosques, banks, schools, and so forth. And uh, to start with, we had 1,256 people who were screened according to their body weight, height, age, and blood pressure. From these two, 1,256 people, we obtained 382 people who were then screened for pre-diabetic. And when we did that, we found out that 35% of them were classified as pre-diabetic, and 14% were already diabetic, and it's 51% who had normal uh, blood sugar concentration. That's to say 19% of the eligible study, we had, uh, uh, the, we had only 19% who co could qualify for the pre-screening, and only 16% who really qualified to be enrolled in the study, and this is again reflected here, starting with 1,256, ending up with only 62 who qualified to enter the study. Just like our colleagues from India, the study is not yet completed, and what I'm going to present to you as preliminary results in for the first phase of intervention, and this will focus mainly on the uh, fasting plasma glucose. As again, we started, we had the washout period here, and we had uh, 32 participants starting at the end, some dropped out, we ended up with 8 already during the first phase. And uh, we also monitored some of the adverse events which were reported, the blood pressure, body weight, glycosylated hemoglobin, and certainly the food, uh, the fasting plasma glucose. So after the weekly, uh, based on the weekly measurement of the capillary fasting plasma glucose, and after the intervention, the beta guard group showed a lower fasting plasma glucose compared to the placebo. This is what we're seeing here. This is the placebo group, and this is the beta guard group. But uh, at this stage, there was a slight increase of plasma, of average plasma, uh, uh, fasting plasma levels uh, when you compare when it started and when we ended. And we were trying to find out why was this increase in both groups, not only on the beta guard group, but also on the placebo group. And we have almost the same explanation as our Indian colleagues, really. The study was, a, was done during Christmas time, 
And during that time of the year, there is less work in Kilimanjaro area. There are a lot of celebrations, including weddings and this and that, and the Christmas itself, and people were feasting and so forth. And we think this could have contributed to this slight increase of the fasting blood uh, glucose in both groups. But uh, if we are to look at the laboratory examination, especially on the glycated hemoglobin and the fasting, uh, fasting, fa fasting plasma glucose from the venous blood which was taken from the patient, from the participants to start with. There was no difference in their values, but uh, at, at the beginning, and if we look at the end of the intervention, there was no significant, there was no significant drop in fasting plasma glucose uh, levels after the beta guard group relay. Um, however, there was uh, the, the fasting plasma glucose levels in placebo increased significantly. And at, after the intervention, the beta guard group tended to have lower fasting plasma glu glucose as compared to the placebo group and uh, there was hardly no change in the glycated uh, hemoglobin levels as we shall further continue to see here. What I'm saying here is that under the placebo group, the patient, the participants showed increased fasting plasma glucose and the beta guard group showed decreased plasma, uh, fasting plasma glucose. Overall, the beta guard treatment decreased average, average laboratory fast plasma glucose while the placebo showed an increase as we are seeing here. So we are talking of the percent, the changes which did take place in these two groups and uh, the change in laboratory fasting plasma glucose, glucose levels were significantly different between the two groups as can be seen there. What was interesting was uh, the findings when we separated women and men. So here we are seeing for women group when we started, they started at N1, they had 5.32, and after intervention, we had, they had, in the placebo group, they had 5.56, and this is the change which was observed, and if we compare the beta guard group starting with 5.32, ending up with 5.10 with this change here, it was significantly that uh, beta guard seemed to be more effective in women than it was in men as we compare the same parameters for men on this side. And uh, as I said earlier, we didn't observe any changes in glycated hemoglobin in both women group and male group. Uh, we certainly did measure 
blood pressures and other parameters, but they are not uh, shown here, but we couldn't find any uh, gender difference between the, the two. Some of the adverse events which were reported were fluctuations. Some people that reported diarrhea, stomach pain, headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting. And this was mainly in the bitter guard group. And then we didn't have any report of hypoglycemia. But I must say here also as well that uh, all these adverse events were also very, very difficult to, you know, to judge whether it was a psychological effect as it was once mentioned by one of our participants. And uh, we had some additional observations and that is that due to the tight inclusion criteria, this did help to reduce risk of adverse events and reduce standard deviation. But on the other hand, it lowered the chance of finding sufficient number of participants. Bearing in mind, we had wanted to have 82 participants, but we ended up with only 62. The dropout was 12.5%, and this was uh, surprisingly lower than what we had expected of 30%, and eventually we had an overall dropout of 16%. Conclusion? Here we are saying that the beta GAR treatment improved fasting plasma glucose levels compared to the placebo. And we are saying that in this first phase, we observed a pronounced effect of beta GAR on women than it was observed on men. And to our knowledge, this was the first study uh, testing the bitter guard drink instead of pills and capsules. And we think in the next studies, if we would use glucose tolerance test after glucose load, this might be able to bring better results for recommendation. And uh, the data evaluation of blood lipids and the other parameters will be done when we shall have completed phase two of the intervention study, which is now been done, and we are saying that further studies following this approach will help to define vegetable-based dietary strategies to improve blood glucose control and are available, and, and especially to be available to people who cannot afford otherwise. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we the ABRDC was the overall owner of the project, we thank them. And the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development did provide the funds to conduct the study. Uh, the people, the laboratory section of the case, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center did the analysis. And I'm really thankful to Barbara, uh, to, uh, <coughs> to Sandra, who did the analysis, and when it comes to questions concerning the analysis, please direct them to her. <laughs> She's better statistics than I am. I would like to certainly thank all participants who were so much motivated in participating in this study, and I do hope when we shall have completed the second phase of the intervention, we shall have more concrete results and so that we can have clear and strong recommendation 
on how consumption of bitter guard can help to monitor blood uh, con um, glucose concentration in our bodies and so doing I think it will contribute quite a lot in reducing precipitating people who are diabetic being precipitated into diabetes and those who are already diabetic to have their diabetes better controlled. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening and uh, I'm prepared to take a few of your questions if I can do so and uh, if I can't, as I said, it was a collaboration between the Gizen University Institution, Institute of Nutrition in Gizen and uh, some of the questions have already been directed to our sisters in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now we can have around five minutes for discussion. Any su suggestion or questions from the audience? I may ask the first one. The dropout rate actually is quite low, even compared with those clinical trials in the Western countries or even in Taiwan. So to lay dropout simply by minor adverse effect like a diarrhea or stomach pain or anything that has been reported to be the side effect of either. So what was the underlying reason that around 12.5 percent of the patient drop out in the clinical study? Yeah, I think, I think um, first of all, fetal medicine is, the perception for fetal medicine in Tanzania is very high. Uh, a lot of people do use traditional medicine, herbs and so forth to treat their ill health problems. And people were very motivated to participate in this study because it was looking at a very sensitive problem, diabetes which is very much on an increasing trend. And people were really motivated to be part of this study, which they thought would bring a solution to their the increasing problem of diabetes. As I said, when I started my clinical studies, uh, clinical um, uh, practice at the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, we, we, we didn't have uh, Diabetes. We didn't see patients with diabetes. And if you go into the hospital today, there are more people being amputated because of side effects of diabetes, diabetes food and so forth, than we have people being amputated because of motor traffic accidents. And therefore people were really motivated to participate and to hang to the study so as to see whether we can get really good results for dietary recommendation. Yes, any other? Yes, please. Yes, my observation in the last two papers or submissions, um, you were telling that you were doing studies on pre-diabetes, isn't it? So, and impaired glucose tolerance between the levels of 100 to 125. That is fine. But when you are comparing HbA1c between 5.5 and 7.5, that doesn't go with it. Because 7.5 HbA1c is a confirmed diabetic patient. And he should be on treatment. He is not a pre-diabetic. If it is less than 6.5, you can say he is a pre-diabetic. So, I think we should not take uh, 7.5 HbA1c levels. So the study is between 5.5 to 6. And uh, um, second thing, 
this uh, diabetes, of course, this uh, bitter gourd. First, initially, I think it should be studied in, it can be studied in normal people also, may not be diabetics. Say 50 people can be taken as control in 50 people as uh, their study. And bitter gourd can be given in normal persons and study whether the sugar levels are low in normal people also. Then we can go for diabetic uh, <coughs> patients. That I think uh, the ABRDC, yeah, which what scientists should first present uh, these data. <coughs> Is there any effect of bitter gourd in normal people in reducing the blood sugar? Then we can study the role of bitter gourd in diabetic patients. Well, if I'm to respond to the glycosylated hemoglobin, you're right. Um, we had even a lower cutoff point. But uh, we found out, according to the criteria, the number of participants would have even gone lower using that strict uh, criteria for glycated the hemoglobin. And uh, we found people who had in slightly higher glycated the hemoglobin, but they were not pre-diabetic and they were not even diabetic. And when we consult the literature, we really will find out these values here may be our American values, and there was one study which did mention we need to look it into the black population because they tend to have higher glycated hemoglobin without being diabetic, and that's why we did increase, and we did ask also uh, from the ethical committee to allow us increase what we had planned for. So I think more studies really need to be done here. There's one, that one study which indicated that, and given that we were finding people with increased glycated hemoglobin but being totally normal without having any diabetes, and that's why we went a little bit higher. So as at least to try and have adequate number of participants. Okay, thanks. It's about time that I have to close this section. Please join me to thank the two speakers. Thank you very much. And we will have 30 minutes. <laughs>